working our way through uh, the Gospel of John. Believe it or not, this has been one year, 52 weeks, every Sunday morning, and we are in the middle of chapter 13. I don't know where I heard the song. I'm not sure that it carries a lot of theological weight. Is it in... uh, When I was a kid, my dad did a a, a devotional every weekday morning at a radio station in Prince George, British Columbia. And as a result of that, he would frequently bring home uh, records, you know, vinyl records. Should have kept them. Now I go into into stores and see these vinyl records for 68 bucks. And uh, and so he would bring home all these things, and, and with four boys... They didn't all hit home, but they would be vinyl LPs, and we didn't have a TV. And we would play these records, and at night we would sit and listen to, oh, there'd be stories of Jack and the Beanstalk. And, and, all. and that was before uh, fairy tales were sinful. And, and so we, we would listen to all these stories, and we were just fascinated. I'm sorry if that bugs you, but we just were fascinated. Somewhere in one of them... They sing a song, I think it has to do with Alice in Wonderland. They sing a song, A Very Merry Unbirthday. Do you all know what I'm talking about? It's a great hymn. A very merry unbirthday to us. Everyone, to us. A very merry... Okay, that was the one. An unbirthday. I say that to tell you the title of this morning's teaching, The Unlord's Supper. From John 13, 21. I think you'll see what I mean as we read. 13, 21. Long text, so just follow along. After saying these things, Jesus was troubled in his spirit and testified, Truly, truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. And the disciples looked at one another, uncertain of whom he spoke. One of the disciples, whom Jesus loved, was reclining at table at Jesus' side. The the way it would work, by the way, in case you've read that and wondered, this would be a a table set up like like a U, open at one end. So it would be like this, so that everybody could see each other, and and the table was low, and so people could come and serve, walking into the open end, and they would place dishes on the table, and then the people sitting around the outside. So that's how it, it got that... John is like reclining beside Jesus at, at the table. 24. So Simon Peter motioned to him to ask Jesus of whom he was speaking. So you get a picture of Peter. They're all troubled in Peter's. You know, psst. And so that disciple leaned back against Jesus, said to him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, It is he to whom I will give this morsel of bread when I have dipped it. And so when he had dipped the morsel, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. Then after he had taken the morsel, Satan entered into him. Jesus said to him, what you are going to do, do quickly. Now no one at the table knew why he said this to him. Some thought that because Judas had the money bag, Jesus was telling him, buy what we need for the feast, or that he should give something to the poor. So they don't have a clue what's going on. 30. So after receiving the morsel of bread, he immediately went out, and it was night. When he had gone out, Jesus said, now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him at once. Little children, Jesus is speaking. Yet a little while, I am with you. You will seek me, and just as I said to the Jews, so now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered him, where I am going, you cannot follow me now. You will follow me afterwards. 
Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. And Jesus answered, will you lay down your life for me? Truly, truly, I say to you, the rooster will not crow till you have denied me three times. Has to be the strangest communion service that ever was. I think when Paul reminds us all of the need to examine ourselves at the Lord's table, by the way, we'll have communion tonight. When he reminds us all to examine ourselves at the Lord's table, you wonder if he had it in mind that, that there was a traitor at the very first Lord's Supper. Judas ran out to sell Jesus for money during the first communion service. And when Judas ran out of the room to sell Jesus for money, he was carrying the piece of bread that Jesus gave him. Bad start. Our Lord's last 24 hours, they continue to fill the Apostle John's mind as he writes what, what we number in our Bibles as the the last nine chapters of his historic account. And in today's text, Judas and Peter take center stage along with Jesus. We get to watch Jesus encounter Judas, a traitor, and Peter, a terribly confused believer. And there, there are a lot of lessons here that we want to work our way through. Point number one. Our Lord reveals the treachery of Judas gradually to cause all of the disciples to a deeper searching of their own hearts. Did you notice when I read in verses 21 and 22, Jesus tells them, truly, truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. And, and then the disciples looked at one another, uncertain of whom he spoke. Now, this is the third time Jesus focuses the disciples' attention on this idea of a hidden traitor in their midst. John actually introduces the battle for Judas' heart in verse 2 of chapter 13. It wasn't in today's text. Let me read it to you. Verse 2, during supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son to betray him. That's mentioned number one. And then Jesus exposes the wickedness of one of his disciples in verses 10 and 11 in chapter 13. Jesus said to him, the one who has bathed does not need to wash except for his feet. We studied this text. But is completely clean. And you are clean, but not every one of you. For he knew who was to betray him. That is why he said, not all of you are clean. So he says this in front of the disciples. That's the second reference Jesus makes. This is followed by another reference in verse 18, where we read, I am not speaking of all of you. I know whom I have chosen, but the scripture will be fulfilled. He who ate my bread has lifted his heel against me. But you'll notice again, the third time, but Jesus still doesn't say it's Judas. Jesus takes three specific occasions to remind the whole group that one of that inner circle, one of his own community of followers, is a traitor. It's only in verses 25, 26, and 27 where Jesus finally comes out and says that it's that it's Judas. It is he whom I will give this morsel of bread when I have dipped it. When he had dipped the morsel, he gave it to Judas. And Judas is pinpointed in front of everyone. And then it says, and Satan entered. Not put it in his mind. That's what Jesus said earlier. Entered into him. Didn't Jesus know right away that it was going to be Judas? 
How many think you knew right away? How many don't think you knew right away? All right, it's carried. He knew right away. And if he knew right away, why this rather lengthy, drawn-out process of exposure? What is Jesus trying to do? Why not just tell him right away? It's Judas. Why does he leave all the disciples? Who is it? What's going on? And I believe, I believe the answer is Jesus is involving the rest of his disciples in reassessing and examining the purity and the loyalty of their own core group. You see, this is a treachery more heartbreaking than that of Pilate or Caiaphas or the religious leaders, the Pharisees. This is a different kind of rejection. This is, this is betrayal. And, and Jesus wants to have his own followers dwell, linger, search out the fact that such actions can arise from their own number. And so Jesus, three times, he plants this idea, doesn't tell them who, and he says it to the group. Three times he plants the idea. Do you see this, this community, this community of followers? It's, it's not what it looks like on the surface. That's the point of Jesus hinting the clues, the gradual exposure, the deliberate sort of peeling back of layers of, of what can lurk just under the surface of a profession of following Jesus. We know, by the way, we know from the testimony of Matthew especially that this is exactly the effect of Jesus' probing words. In Matthew 26, 22, after Jesus says one of them is going to betray him, Matthew 26, 22, Matthew records this. And they were very sorrowful, that's the group, and they began to say to him, one after another, Lord, is it I? Those are poignant words. Notice that all the disciples, all of the disciples, except Judas, are described by Matthew, who was there, as being very sorrowful. All of them. They were, they were humbled. They were brokenhearted. They were all turned into looking into their own minds and hearts that they might be less loyal to Jesus than they thought. Paul says, you examine yourselves when you come to the Lord's table. Could their own hearts be growing cold? Lord, is, is it I? Could their hearts have shifted in gradual ways that they hadn't noticed? And so Jesus gradually reveals this concept, and I believe, the text doesn't say this, I believe, there's, the best evidence is Jesus is trying to awaken this wonderful sorrow. They were all sorrowful, Matthew says. Jesus forces these magnificent questions. Me? Is, is there something off base in my heart that I'm not aware of? That's Jesus' loving way of not just exposing Judas, but regrounding and sharpening the whole group. And this, by the way, is the theology driving Paul's words in 2 Corinthians 13, 5. Paul says, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. This question. Do you not realize this about yourselves? That Jesus Christ is in you? Unless indeed you fail to meet the test? 
It's, it's only as we put Matthew's account together with John's, we can see it was probably after this time of introspection where they all said, Lord, is, is it I? It's only after that time that Jesus finally turned their attention outward. The question Peter urges through John becomes, Lord, who is it? So there's a reason, I think, for the way Jesus reveals this. Point number two. Examination of heart is a necessity because one can look like a follower of Christ without being a follower of Christ. I get that from 23 to 29 in chapter 13. One of his disciples, whom Jesus loved, was reclining at table at Jesus' side, so Simon Peter motioned to him to ask Jesus of whom he was speaking. And so that disciple, leaning back against Jesus, said to him, and didn't say, Lord, who is it? And now, after three previous mentions, Jesus answered, 26, it is he to whom I will give this morsel of bread when I have dipped it. And so when he dipped the morsel, he gave it to Judas, son of Simon Iscariot. And then after he had taken the morsel, Satan entered into him. Jesus said to him, now he's talking directly to Judas. No explanation. We don't know what else Jesus said. The disciples hear this question. We know that. Jesus speaks to Judas and says, what you are going to do, do quickly. And then John adds, now no one at the table knew why Jesus said this to him. Some thought that because Judas had the money bag, Jesus was telling him, buy what you need for the feast, Passover, or that he should give something to the poor. So, so there's no indication that John told Peter what Jesus revealed about Judas. And, and John's account seems to hint Jesus didn't tell the rest of the disciples right away that the betrayer was Judas. The disciples don't even know why Judas left the room in such a hurry. They think he's out to buy groceries. Those in the community who don't truly follow Christ always want to look like they follow Christ. That's what makes their, their issue so serious. You, you only have to think back to some verses we studied in John chapter 12. 42 and 43. These verses show how the desire to please those of our group can overrule the call to loyalty and commitment to Christ. John 12, 42. Nevertheless, many, even of the authorities, believed in him, that's in Jesus, but for the fear of the Pharisees, they didn't confess it. They didn't want to make it obvious so that they would not be put out of the synagogue. For, so this is the reason, they loved the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from, from God. This self-deception manifests itself in Judas over and over again. In, in John 12, remember when, uh, when Mary pours that expensive ointment over Jesus' feet and wipes them with her hair? Judas, Judas is the one who speaks up. And Judas has to fake concern for the poor when the real cause of his grief is he loves money. But he can't, he can't come out of the closet on that point. Why? Well, because he wants to fit in with the disciples. He can't, he can't expose himself. When Matthew records Jesus' final meal, this is really fascinating. Matthew records Jesus' final meal, the same as John's recording in John 13, 
with his inner circle. I read the verses where the disciples all say, Lord, is it I? Is it I? They're sorrowful. Interestingly, Judas is forced to fake the same question. Matthew 26, 21 to 25. As they were eating, Jesus said, truly, truly, one of you will betray me. Okay, they were very sorrowful. So there's the group. They're genuinely sorrowful. And began to say to him after one after another, is it I? He answered, he who has dipped his hand into the dish with me will betray me. The son of man goes as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the son of man is betrayed. It would have been better if that man had not been born. Which, by the way, smacks of a message of eternal judgment. Because if he's just annihilated and ceases to exist, that's the same as never having been born. And Jesus said, it's worse than never having been born. Okay, so they all say, here's the question. They all say, Lord, is it I? Is it I? Judas, he's already been exposed. And he's still playing this game. Judas, who would betray him, answered, is it I? What an idiot. What, what does he think Jesus is going to say? No, no, Judas, not you. Judas is forced to ask the same question the other ones ask because he has to look like the group. Do you see it? That's what they're all asking Jesus. He'll be conspicuous. He'll stand out if he doesn't ask the same question. So Judas says, oh, oh by the way, Lord, is, is it I? And you, yeah, you, you said so, Judas. Hangs himself. Don't miss what's happening here. It's a, it's a powerful picture of human nature. After all the other disciples have questioned Jesus, Judas can't stop himself from playing the game. He's done it for years. And the question is his undoing. But he has to ask it or he won't look like, he won't look like the rest of them. He's a faker. He has to blend in. Fakes himself into disaster. What, 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 what do we, I'm talking to me too, um, what do we take home from this point? So we're talking about Judas, but, but what do we take home as we live our Christian lives in this world? And here's what I think the church lesson is. The church lesson is this. So this is the part to remember. Nothing blocks repentance more than the ability to hide in the congregation. Nothing blocks repentance more than the ability to hide in the congregation. I need to remember that in professional ministry. We all need to remember it when we sit with multiplied hundreds and listen to God's word. You see, it's those other people all around you right now that make it feel safe not to respond repentantly when the Holy Spirit speaks through his word. That's why we don't. Nobody can pick you out. Do you understand what I'm saying? That's Judas. Point number three. There's deep significance in Jesus giving the broken bread to Judas. I get that in verses 26 to 30. So Peter tells John to ask the question. John asks Jesus, Psst, who is it? 
Now, 26, Jesus answered, It is he to whom I will give this morsel of bread when I have dipped it. So, when he had dipped the morsel, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. There's something official now, the full name. It's like a pronouncement. I knew I was in trouble when my dad would yell up to the boys fooling around in their bedrooms, Donald Michael Horbin. you just go, whoa. <laughs> and then you'd fool around a little bit more until you'd hear his feet coming up the uncarpeted stairs. And then, then you just, like all of us, then you start repenting. I'll be good, I'll be good, I'll be good. It is he to whom I will give this morsel of bread when I've dipped it. So he does. He gives it to Simon, Judas, son of Simon Iscariot. Then after he had taken the morsel, Satan entered into him. I want to talk about that. Jesus said to him, what you're going to do, do quickly. Now, no one at the table knew why he had said this to him. Some thought that because Judas had the money bag, Jesus was telling him, buy what you need for the feast or that he should give something to the poor. So after receiving the morsel of bread, he immediately went out. And then these words, and it was night. John doesn't just mean night, it was, but there's, there's 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 a dark corner now in the story. I think there are two reasons Jesus chooses to identify Judas with this broken piece of bread. Two reasons. The first is, one that I'm absolutely sure of because it's right there in the text. It's an obvious fulfillment of the prophetic words from Psalm 41, 9, which reads, Even my close friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted his heel against me. So this is, this is yet again, another reminder from our Lord to his disciples that his impending death isn't a failure of a plan. They might think that. This isn't a failure. This is a fulfillment of Father God's perfect will. And so Jesus chooses a sign that fulfills a prophecy so that it will increase their faith after he's gone. It's a loving act that Jesus does here. They'll be able to think this through. Now, the second reason is just my opinion. I believe there's something in the giving of the bread which will be more fully developed in the theology of Paul's writings, the Lord's broken body and shed blood, but which even now, even as Judas takes it, it might call the disciples' minds back to these words from Jesus earlier that he had already spoken, John 6, 33 to 35, For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And they said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Now, here's the part that I find very moving. Whoever comes to me, Jesus hands him this broken bread. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. I find something wonderful in the way whoever comes to me, Jesus, I'm the bread. Could it be, I'm just asking the question, could it be that Jesus would still accept Judas? Could it be that that telltale piece of bread handed to Judas is our Lord's last effort to awaken his darkened conscience. Whoever comes to me, Judas, the bread. The very sign of Judas's betrayal is the greatest sign of our Lord's ability to cleanse and nourish and feed and restore. And Judas runs from that room with the bread in his fist. Self-deception 
It's a cruel slave driver. There, there comes a time. Nobody likes to think about it, and pastors don't like to talk about it. But there comes a time of a great inner reversal. There, there can come a time when the merciful exposure of inner sin only deepens the commitment to that sin. There comes a very dangerous time when the entrance of truth only fires the rebellion that's present in the heart. Grace, grace can be resisted and that fake polished image Judas is it I Lord surely not I he's already got the plan worked out for the 30 pieces of silver what's he doing he's playing games he's grandstanding so grace can be resisted in that fake polished image it can be sustained only for so long. And it's interesting to me that while Satan had been 13-2, if you got it, had been putting things into the heart of Judas for quite a while, it is only after this, this final rejection, takes this bread, runs out of the room, it's only after this, this final rejection that Satan is actually said, verse 27, to enter Judas. A, a line gets crossed. No wonder Paul warns the church that a lot can happen at the communion table. Point number four. Three quick lessons. Three lessons Jesus taught Peter. I said the story revolves around Judas and it revolves around Peter. Three lessons Jesus taught after Judas left the room. 13, 31 through 35. When he had gone out, so Judas is gone, Jesus said, and, and you notice a corner turn. The whole conversation is different. When he had gone out, 31, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him at once. That's quite involved. We'll talk about it. 33, little children, yet a little while I am with you, you will seek me. And just as I said to the Jews, so now I also say to you, where I'm going, you cannot come. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, isn't it interesting, on the heels of being betrayed. Jesus starts talking about how important it is that they love one another. Just as I have loved you, you are also to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So, from his own account, it's certain that John knows about the betrayal of Judas immediately. Jesus tells him. So John at least knows. From Matthew's account, it's very likely that they all know shortly after. So now... Judas leaves the room, and Jesus moves to comfort his disciples in the middle of this horrifying moment. Just when it looked like the bottom was falling out of everything they had been living for, Jesus reminds them of three key pillars of truth. That's what we're going to wrap up with. A. This impending death only felt like a disaster now. It was actually a moment of intense manifestation of divine glory. I get that in 31 and 32. When he, Judas, had gone out, Jesus said, Now, right now, oops, I did something there. Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. So, Son and Father, both glorified. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him at once. 
Notice those two time references. Now, at once. Jesus is saying something pretty emphatic. Something absolutely glorious was happening immediately upon his death. It would take us weeks of teaching to drill down into all the glorious things that were happening at once when Jesus died. The redemption of the repentant. The satisfaction of the just wrath of God. The securing of our eternal happiness and well-being, whatever life on earth gets like. The casting out of the ruler of this present age, Jesus said. Now is the ruler of this age cast out. The complete fulfilling of the law of God on my behalf. Glorious indeed. That's what Jesus is saying. Glorious accomplishments. Right here, that's when this is happening, Jesus tells them. The second lesson. Jesus prepares them for the loss of his visible presence as they had known it. 33 and 36. Little children, yet a little while I'm with you. You will seek me. And just as I said to the Jews, so now I also say to you, where I'm going, you cannot come. So there's, there's a separation. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? And Jesus said, where I am going, you cannot follow me now. You will follow afterwards. Jesus, Jesus is going to die. He will defeat death. He will ascend to the Father. Peter, you can't come with me now, but you will, you'll, you'll join me. You'll come. You're, you're not going to live forever, Peter. You're going to be executed, he tells him. The nature of the relationship that they would have with Jesus would change, and he graciously prepares them for that. But that would not make it less authentic. They would have to wait to be reunited with Jesus visibly. And even that is a faith, a, a promise-filled word. All but one of these Christ followers, all but one, would be executed for their faith in Jesus. And even in the space of such pain and suffering, Jesus tells them now that this death will merely be a means of uniting them more directly with himself. This actually should encourage us, this text. This should encourage us because Jesus is preparing his first disciples to follow and serve and trust him under the same conditions you and I must trust and follow and serve him without visibly seeing him. Jesus explains this is part of the plan. It's not a mistake. It's not a failure. The third thing that we get in the way of lessons is visible love for each other in the church sustains disciples while Christ isn't here physically. That's in 34 and 35. A new commandment I give to you that you love one another just as I have loved you you also are to love one another. Just as, exactly the same as, I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. It's a, it's a striking fact the way this summons to mutual love in the church, it comes right on the heels of the announcement of Jesus' departure from them. How, how, how will we get along without Jesus being right here physically with us? And Jesus says, well, in the body of Christ, there's going to be a mutual love one for another. And that's the only way you're going to make it.
The world in which disciples live without a visibly present Lord, that world is hostile to their values, it's hostile to their Savior. It can be costly to love Jesus in a culture like ours. Mutual, visible love is our Lord's appointed means of encouraging and supporting the body of Christ. We are to serve each other just the same way that our Lord demonstrated. Remember when he washed the disciples' feet. People will need care in a world like this. We might find it strange at first glance that we're not told in this text that the world will know we are Christians by our love for God or by our love for Jesus. Because that's what I would have put. By this, people will know you're my followers by your love for each other. Probably that's because it's much easier to sing about how much we love Jesus than to express service love for the visible church. I believe that the church needs to uh, rediscover the rather robust idea that in this present world, church love, church love is as important as Christ love. By this, the world will know you're my disciples, your love for each other. Love for the community. The trendy thing now, of course, is I I love Jesus. I'm not crazy about going to church all that often, but I just have a personal relationship with Jesus. And the New Testament just blows that apart. Can't do it. You love Jesus as much as you love his church. I had a guy say it to me once, and I never forgot it. I can't show you chapter and verse, but here's what he said. You love Jesus as much as you love the one person you dislike the most. You love Jesus as much as you love the one person you dislike the most. This concept from Jesus, one of the last things he said... Church love is very important. Church love is very important. This is how the world will know. This is how the world will be reached. Last point, point number five. Jesus, two lessons for Peter and how they relate to the church. When I look at Jesus and his talks with Peter, I see Jesus holding up two ideas and then saying, you have to keep these ideas together. And the church traditionally has pulled them apart. Jesus' last two conversations with Peter go like this. One we just studied. It's in John 13, 8 through 10. Jesus was washing the feet. Do you remember? And he comes around to Peter. It's in verses 8, 9, and 10. And Peter says, no, 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 no. You're not washing my feet. Jesus says, if I don't wash you, you have no share with me. Okay? Then Peter says, oh, not my feet, but my head, my hands, the whole bit. I'm in. And then Jesus says, the one who has bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean, and you are clean. Okay. Jesus comes to Peter, conversation one. Peter knows about all his failures, all his faults, all his shortcomings. That's why he says, Jesus, no, 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 no. It's not right for you to wash my feet. Jesus ends up telling Peter, I've washed you. And he's talking about his coming death on the cross. And he says, you are clean. In spite of all your failures, in spite of all your uh, impulsiveness, in spite of all your fears, and all the things you think disqualify you, Peter, you are clean. Stand in that grace. Wonderful truth. Now, this conversation today is in verses 37 and 38. Jesus is going away, and Peter keeps pressing him about why he can't go with him. Lord, why can I not follow you now? 37, I will lay down my life for you. He thinks he would, too, I think. I don't think Peter's lying. I think he's just delusional. 
You'll lay down your life for me. That's what, that's what Jesus says to Peter. The rooster will not crow until you've denied me three times, denied even knowing me. Here are the two things to hold together. Peter, you're completely clean. In spite of all your failures and in spite of all your faults, just because you repeatedly have to have your feet washed, you can still rest in a finished redemption. You're clean. Secondly, Peter, before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times. Stand in grace, relying on Christ. Always be careful about your impulsiveness and your weaknesses. So you have, so you have confidence, confidence mixed with diligence. And the church has traditionally vacillated choosing one or the other. And what you see from Jesus' last two conversations with Jesus is, no, every time you fail doesn't mean you've lost your salvation. But don't presume and don't assume you're stronger than you are. Confidence, you're clean. Diligence, before the rooster crows, you're going to deny ever knowing me three times. I think you can see where Jesus is leading, Peter. Peter. Confidence, carefulness. There's a mighty certainty just relying on Christ alone. And there's a horrible presumption that we're stronger than we are without him. Live in the blend. Live in the balance. Rest in Christ alone. Wrestle against unbelief and carelessness. And everyone said...